one of the premises of this series is that we believe that God wants to do amazing things in our lives, but not just in our lives, but also through our lives into the lives of people all around us. And, and we really believe that's what the Bible teaches. God loves to bless us as his kids so that we can be a blessing to other people. Can I hear an amen to that? The blessing is never meant to just come to us and stay stuck with us, but it's meant to flow through us to make an impact in the world around us. And, and that's one of the premises of this series. And this, this evening, we're going to talk in part two. The title of our message is More Than Enough. Because God is the God of more than enough. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 6. And we're going to take a look at this passage here. Last week, we looked at one of the first, mir- or literally the first miracle that Jesus ever performed. And uh, we're going to look at now one of, the, one of the more recent ones after that miracle had taken place. But John chapter 6, and it starts off here in verse 4. It's up on screen for you if you don't have your Bibles with you. It says this, the Jewish Passover was near. Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? He asked this, now notice this, only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. If you have your notes there, you might want to circle, highlight, or underline that phrase. He said this only to test him because he already had in mind what he was going to do. Verse 7, Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Well, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Now, something you got to understand about ancient writing, they usually only recorded the men. Uh, I know, very chauvinistic. I'm sorry, don't get mad at me. You know, that's just kind of how it was in that day. Thankfully, we've evolved. But anyway, um, historians say that if there were 5,000 men, if you were to count the women and children that were definitely in the audience or in the crowd, there would have been anywhere from 15 to 20,000 people there that day. So wouldn't you agree this is a giant crowd? You know, this is like Bruno Mars concert two size crowd. You know what I mean? Like, where are we going to have enough food to feed all of these people? They're out in the wilderness. There's no 7-Eleven nearby. You can't do a run. You know what I'm saying? Pick up some Jumbo Jacks and come back. You know what I mean? Like, there's, there's nothing. So here's a, here's a problem. We're out in the middle of nowhere. 20,000 people gathered, and Jesus said, give them something to eat. <laughs> okay, small kind of problem. All right, anyway, <clears throat> verse 11. So, so, so they found this boy with five barley loaves and two fish. Verse 11, Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, his disciple, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus took the five barley loaves and the two fish, and he made a way, he multiplied it to feed over 20,000 people that day, and people came to faith in him. So let's, let's take away some lessons from this passage and apply it to our lives. In your notes there, it says this, God uses apparent times of weakness to test us. God uses apparent times of weakness, of lack, of shortage to test us. Now, when most of us, we hear the word test, we all get a little itchy, right? We get a little anxious and nervous because we hated tests in school. Isn't that true? And and usually when we think about tests, we think of it like a pass-fail kind of thing. Like if I fail this test, I'm done, it's over, it's a bad thing. But when you think about it the way that the Bible puts it, tests aren't meant to be a bad thing. They're meant to actually be a good thing because they show us where we are so that we can grow. Isn't that true? That's actually what tests are supposed to do. They show you where you're weak. You're weak in spelling. Huh, that's me. All right? So you can get better there. It's not you're bad at that, so you're a horrible person forever. It shows this is where you're weak, and this is where God was going to cause you to grow, or he wants you to grow. And similarly, God uses apparent times of weakness or lack to test us so that our faith can grow. This was a test. The Bible says it right here, right? He said this to Philip only to test him because he already knew what was in his heart and mind, what he was going to already do. And tests in our lives are meant to grow our faith. They're, They're meant to teach us about what it means to walk with God, what it means to trust God. And all of us in our lives are going to face seasons and situations where there's just not enough, where we feel like there's a lack, where we feel like there's, we're weak and we can't do anything. And that's the place where God wants us to learn to trust in him even more. Many of you have probably heard this saying before, but, you know, it's kind of a common thing that people will say, God will never let you go through something that you can't handle. Anybody ever heard that phrase? Anybody ever share that with a friend? Don't worry, God will never let you go through something you can't handle. That's actually not true. So if you told your friend that, you can call them later and tell them it's not true. I'm sorry. Um, Because the reality is 
God allows us to go through things that we can't handle pretty often. Does anybody notice that? I feel like God allows me to go through things that I can't handle quite often. And we see it in scripture quite often. People are put, put, put in places that they, they just can't handle it. And here's the reason why. God will, will allow us to go through things that we can't handle on our own to force us to depend on him. God will allow us to go through things that we can't handle on our own so that we learn to walk with him and trust in him by faith. If we could handle it on our own, then we wouldn't need God. One of the greatest problems that we can't handle on our own is this thing called death, right? Can you handle that on your own? No. The only way that we overcome death is by the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus' resurrection from the dead, right? The problem of sin. I mean, there are so many problems in our lives that we cannot handle on our own. And if we think that we can just get through it on our own, then we're going to push God away and we're just going to try to figure it out ourselves. And in the process, we miss the lesson of faith that God wants to teach us. When you come to a situation that you can't handle on your own, it's meant to force you to look up. When we find ourselves in a place of lack, like, I just can't do this on my own. I can't handle this anymore. It's, it's supposed to get us to look up and to learn to trust in God at a greater degree. And all of us <clears throat> in our lives are going to go through things that we can't handle on our own. Usually what we try to do, though, is we try to figure it out ourselves first. Isn't that true? Like, let me figure it out first. And when I f- can't figure it out, then I'll pray. Then I'll call on God. You realize that that's backwards. We're supposed to trust in God from the very beginning rather than try to figure it out on our own. Humanism tells us that in and of ourselves as human beings, we can solve any problem. If you just learn to think right, yeah, um, learn to give out positive vibes or whatever it is, get the right energy going in yourself, right? Think right, do right, then you can solve any problem. The problem with humanism is it rejects this notion that we're supposed to depend on God. Christianity tells us, no, 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 humans from the very beginning are meant to be dependent on God. From the very beginning in the garden, it was Adam and Eve and God. And the moment they pushed God aside, problems started to happen. And so in our lives, the sooner we can learn to trust in him and walk with him and follow him, even for the smallest things that we talked about last week, the better off we'll be. So tests are meant to bring us to that place. And I remember when we were going through uh, the situation with our son's health. And, and if you've been around, you've heard this story before, but for about three years, there were no solutions to why he couldn't sleep, why he was itching, why he had rashes all over his body. We saw every doctor that we could find and spent more money than I'd like to talk about from naturopaths to medical doctors, and there was no solution. We came to the end of ourselves. And you know what I learned in that situation was God wanted me to learn to trust in him, learn, wanted me to learn to depend on him. And in the midst of it, as I, I began to depend on him, he gave us the strength to get through a, a three-year really difficult season. And in, the, in that test, it was meant to develop our faith. And for, for many of us right now, we're facing situations where we feel like there's just not enough, and we're not looking to God. We're getting bitter. We're getting angry. We're complaining, right, rather than looking to him. And so we find the disciples in this situation, they had, a, they had a problem. There was not enough in the natural. But God wanted them to take their eyes off of the natural and begin to look to the supernatural, and begin to trust in a God who is greater than our circumstances. Can I hear an amen to that? So what season of testing are you facing right now where it doesn't seem like there's enough? Maybe it's in your finances, and you're going to hear a testimony in just a second about that. Maybe it's in a relationship. Where it's just not enough, man. I, I, don't, I can't do this marriage anymore. I can't handle my kids anymore. I can't handle my boss or my coworkers anymore. It's just not enough, God. Maybe this is the situation that God is using to force us to look to him. We've tried every natural solution. It's not working. Now maybe we need to look to him. What is that situation for you? Second thing we see here in our notes is that God is glorified <clears throat> as we use what we have or as we are faithful with what we have. So Jesus said to his disciples, go find out. What what do we have out there? These people are hungry. And in Mark's account, there in your notes, uh, Mark's account of the same event, he told his disciples, go and see. Go see what what provisions are out there. What's out there? And Andrew goes and finds this boy with five barley loaves and two fish. Now, some some people say, you know, that was his lunch, you know. Um, But I think it's more likely that it wasn't this little boy's lunch. Because five barley loaves and two fish is a lot for a kid to eat, especially back in that day. What was more likely was he was sent to go buy food for his family, probably for a few days. And he was coming home with the groceries, you know what I'm saying? And he showed up at this situation. He heard about Jesus. Oh, my God, Jesus is preaching. I got to go check this out on the way home. And he's got this basket of five barley loaves and two fish, and he shows up. And then the disciples start going, has anybody got food out there? Anybody have any food? Because Jesus is asking us to look for some food. Does anybody have any food? And you know the little boy's thinking, ooh, I got some food. But if I give it to you, I'm going to go home and get some cracks from my mom. You know what I'm saying? She sent me to get food. And and if I don't come home with this, uh, then what's going to happen? But he took what he had, 
And he was probably worried about what was going to happen if he, if he spoke up. Oh, I got some food. Like, are you going to take it from me? What's going to happen? But he took what he had and he placed it in the hands of God. And God did a miracle and he multiplied it. See, when we're faithful with what we have and we, we use and trust into God's hands what we have, he is able to multiply it. But very often, here's what we do. We take what we have, and instead of trusting it into God's hands, we try to figure it out ourselves, or we withhold it from God until we've got it figured out. Whether it be a relationship, our finances, our jobs, our career, our destiny, whatever we, we think our lives, we withhold it from God rather than entrust it to God. And I got to imagine being that boy, I don't know, I, I don't know about you, I'd be a little nervous. I'm going to give up my five barley loaves and two fish. That's my family's food for the next few days. What if Jesus doesn't come through? What if nothing happens? What if I go home empty-handed, right? All of these what-ifs. And isn't that kind of stuff that goes through your mind when you, when you think about trusting God and following God with your life? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if things go this way? What if things don't go the way that I want? But you, you realize, I've learned to realize that all the what-ifs in the world don't matter. When we place our lives in God's hands, he, he's, always, he's a much better leader of my life than I am. Anybody notice that? He's a much better leader and steward of my, my resources than I am. And when we place our lives in God's hands, he's able to multiply it. But, what, but, but we got to watch out for that, that thing inside of us that makes us want to withhold and to keep away from God and to run from God rather than entrust our lives to God. I remember when I first, um, before I first started coming to church, you know, the only Christians that I ever knew um, you know, I, I, I just, let's just say I wasn't too impressed with them. You know what I'm saying? And I, I know you've probably got in minds of Christians in your mind or whatever. But I, I was always afraid, like, man, if I, if I go to church, am I going to become one of those weirdo Christians, like those people that I know in my mind? And maybe, maybe I'm the only cynical one in here. But anyway, that's what was going through my mind. Or maybe God's going to make me do some crazy stuff that, like, I would never want to do, right, if I follow him. I had all these what-ifs going on in my head. But you know what? What, place, what I've come to realize now over 20 years is having placed my life in God's hands was the, was the best thing I could have ever done. And I wish I'd have done it sooner and not let the what ifs keep me from bringing my life to God and placing it in his hands. And whatever you have right now that you're afraid to place into his hands, to entrust into his hands, we're only withholding from him and, and maybe slowing down the breakthrough that God wants to bring into your life. God is honored. When we place our lives into his hands, he is glorified when we use what we have and place it into his hands. Luke 16.10 says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. In other words, he watches to see how faithful we are with the little that we're given. Or or he watches to see what we're going to do with what we've been given, our lives, our time, our treasure, our talents. How faithful are we with that? Because if we're faithful to entrust it into his hands, he's faithful to multiply it like he did with the boys, five loaves and two fish. And notice at the end of the story, there were 12 basketfuls left over. I guarantee you that boy went home with one of those basketfuls. I guarantee you he took that, that five loaves and two fish that he had turned into a basket full of food and he brought it home. And he was like, mom, look what I got. Where'd you get that? Oh, you're never going to believe this. But there's this guy, Jesus, right? Remember, they thought he might be the Messiah. Well, he did this and blah, 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 blah. And here you go. And I guarantee you that turned into a testimony that blessed many people. As he trusted what little he had into God's hands, God was able to multiply it. <clears throat> it's kind of neat. Just uh, this past week, we heard a bunch of stories of, uh, of miracle testimonies that have happened. I want to share one of them with you. Um, this past Wednesday, I found out about this on Thursday. Uh, but on Wednesday, uh, two, two of the members of our church, longtime members, Fred and Elaine Rivera, some of you may know who they are. Uh, they've been longtime members of our church. Fred and Elaine actually helped to uh, mentor and disciple a lot of us when we were in high school. And so they've been around for a long time. And um, they were filing their taxes on Wednesday. And everybody filed your taxes? You know, it's like due tomorrow, right? Okay, so uh, anyway, they were, they were doing their taxes on Wednesday. And after doing their, their, their taxes, realized that they owed the government $2,000. They, they, they had a $2,000 tax bill that they needed to pay. And so I don't know how you feel when you realize you owe the government money, but you want to find a way to lower that number. Isn't that true? <laughs> what are the deductions I can do to make this go away? Well, anyway, Fred was tempted to claim one of his nieces as a dependent to lower his tax bill, to get that child tax credit. All right. Now, before you get judgmental, I had thought about that many times. I only have three kids, but man, if I just had one more. You know what I'm saying? Maybe Nomi's pregnant. Who knows? You know, let's go for this, right? I know they got to be born already. I get it. 
So, you know, as, as I heard this story, I was like, dude, I would totally do that. Or I would think that at least. So anyway, he talked it over with his wife. And of course, they decided not to do that. We need to honor God with what's his and, and, not, and be truthful and not, you know, all those kinds of things. So he decided we're not going to lie. We're going to file these taxes. So he went to get a cashier's check for $2,000 to pay the tax bill, put it in an envelope and was ready to send it out. It was done. Later that evening, he gets a phone call from his job. And, and Pastor Camille's telling me this story, okay, so, and, and they, ver- they verified it. He got a phone call from his job Wednesday night telling him that, that they noticed a discrepancy in their payroll, that Fred was actually getting underpaid for three years because he had, he had started working at a, doing supervisor responsibilities three years ago, but never had his, pay, his salary adjusted to compensate for that. So they said, we're going to pay you back the three years of back pay that we owe you, and we're going to officially promote you to the supervisor position that you've been working at for the last three years, which has double, more than double the pay that he was making right now. You know, the 11 o'clock service was like, wow. So you guys got to step it up, all right? There's the feedback. Let's get the feedback going, all right? I mean, I, mean that, I don't know if you noticed that, but that's a miracle. That the day he decided to honor God with his wealth, he was tested. And he decided, I'm going to honor God and trust in God. God made up far more than the $2,000 that he he was going to pay back to the government. God gave him exceedingly abundantly more. There were basketfuls left over. Amen. And that's, God can do that in a moment. You realize that in a moment, God can change your circumstances. In a moment, he can change things that, that have been stopped up in blessings that have been held back for years. God can change that in a moment. But very often, he's waiting to see if we're going to be faithful with what he's given us. Now, I admit, man, I would be super tempted to claim, you know, I mean, I'm sure that the knee stays with them a lot. I mean, you could, you could vouch for the fact that I take care of them a lot. You know what I'm saying? It would be so easy to compromise and to sin and to lie, you know, just a little bit. But God is up in heaven. And he's watching. And he said, can I trust you with greater resources? Can I trust you with greater wealth? And when we're faithful with what we have, God is able to multiply that. And I think Fred and Elaine's story is just a great example of that. And so many of us today... We're wondering, God, when are you going to break through for me? When is that breakthrough going to come? And very often, I think God up in heaven is going to say, when are you going to be faithful with what I've given you? We're saying we're waiting on God, and God is waiting on us. And, and maybe you're here, and you know something's going off in your mind right now. Oh, I need to be faithful in that area. I need to begin to trust God in this area. I need to place this area of my life into his hands. And maybe that's the very thing that's holding back the breakthrough of God in your life. Maybe that little boy with the bread and fish, maybe his family was wondering, when are we going to get that breakthrough? Of food. I mean, maybe he took all 12 baskets home with him. I don't know, right? But, but it was when he offered what he had to God that God multiplied it. And that breakthrough of, of food went home with him. You see that? What, what, what have you been withholding from God? What have you been holding back? Because that may be the very thing that is holding back your breakthrough from God. What are you withholding from God? Because that may be the thing that's holding back your breakthrough from God. Next point here in your notes says this. Be thankful and faithful. And trust God to multiply it. Be thankful and faithful and trust God to multiply it. The little boy placed the loaves and two fish in Jesus' hands. Jesus goes up, verse 11 says, He took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to all who were seated as much as they wanted. You know, I, I realize very often when we feel like we don't have enough, I do this. When I don't feel like I have enough, when things aren't going the way that I want, I can get very ungrateful. Anybody else want to admit that? See a few people nodding, only a few honest people in the, in the audience, right? Uh, when, when, I, when I feel like I don't have enough, I get very ungrateful for what I have. How come I don't have what that person has? How come I don't have a bigger house like those people have? How come I don't have this, that, or the other thing? And, you realize, and I realize that we tend to curse the very thing that we want God to bless. You ever notice that? We, we, with our words and our actions, we tend to curse the very thing that I'm asking God to bless. And then I wonder why God's not blessing it. Because I'm not grateful with it. I'm not faithful with it. We curse things by not, by not giving thanks or being thankful with it. And we say things like, oh, how come my husband isn't like so-and-so's husband? You know what I'm saying? How come my wife isn't like so-and-so's wife? How come I don't get paid as much as so-and-so gets paid? And with our words, we're speaking negative and we're speaking death into situations that we're saying, God, but I want life here. What would happen if we would change our perspective? And look at the little that we have and not curse it, but say, Jesus, I'm thankful for this. Thank you that I even have these five loaves and two fish, right? The disciples, I and mean, that's the first thing Andrew said, well, how far is this going to go with so many? 
curse. You know what I'm saying? What if he said, Jesus, this is all we got, but with you, it's more than enough. You know what I'm saying? He probably would have gotten an award right there. You know, good job, Andrew. You're the man, you know, right? But very often we curse with our words and our actions, the very thing that we want God to bless. You realize that if Fred and Elaine had lied on their tax returns, not only could they have gotten in trouble with the IRS, but they'd have cursed the very thing that they're asking God to bless. You curse your finances when you're not honest with them. And by the way, the Bible is very clear. If you don't tithe, you're cursing yourself. Sorry, it's a side message for another day, right? We curse with our actions and our words the very thing that we want God to bless, and then we get mad at God. How come you're not blessing me? You're not being faithful with what I've given you. You're cursing yourself. Stop doing that. Maybe today we need to start being more thankful and faithful with what we have and watch as God then turns around and is able to do the impossible. We, we want God to bless our marriages, but then we curse it with our words. We want God to bless our, our health, but then we curse it with our actions and our words. We want God to bless our relationships, but then we're not thankful, we're not faithful. We want God to bless our finances, but we don't honor him with it. There's a contradiction there. And maybe tonight God wants us to reorder our priorities so that we could experience the blessing of God. And it can flow in us and then through us into the lives of other people all around us. So that we'll have a testimony to tell people, hey, my marriage was just as broken as yours. But here's what God did. My relationships were just as broken. My finances were just as broken. But I began to trust in God and look at what he did. He can do the same thing for you. Don't curse what you want God to bless. And then lastly, and we said this last week, but I wanted to revisit it again. God wants miracles to happen through us. God wants miracles to happen through us. Jesus looked up to heaven, said a blessing, broke the, broke the loaves, and Mark's account says, and he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. He gave it to the disciples. Here's, here's the provision, and I want it to not just flow to you, but through you to all of these people. Can you imagine having been the disciples? Can you imagine having been Andrew? He was the one who found the five loaves and two fish from that boy, and just seeing it multiply, going out to feed tens of, tens of thousands. He must have been like, oh my God, this is amazing. God, you are amazing, and you want to use me, and you want to work through me. Can you imagine being the boy who offered it up? He was the one who bought it at the market and presented it to Jesus, and here it is feeding a multitude. Oh, my God, this guy is the Messiah. You realize God doesn't need to use us, but he chooses to use us. Uh, one, of, one of the ancient church theologians, his name is Augustine, said God could easily have used the angels to do everything that he needed to do on the earth, but if he'd have done that, he would be denigrating the human beings that he created. It would be a denigration to us that God can't use us because we're too incompetent or whatever. So he has to use angels. But that's not God's, he, that's not his thing. He wants to use us so that we feel like we're a part of it. Not just so that we feel like it, but we actually are a part of it. That when you pray for that friend that's sick or you get to pray for that coworker or lead that person to Christ or share your testimony with someone, you're not just a passive recipient. You're an active participant in the kingdom of God. See, if you're just a passive recipient, man, it's easy to get entitled or to feel, you know, feel small and just kind of useless. But God wants us to realize that we're his sons and his daughters, not just called to be passive recipients, but active participants in bringing the kingdom of God to this earth. And it does something in you. It enlarges you. And God wants his miracles not just to happen to us, but through us. God wants to use you. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and just tell him God wants to use you. Mark 16, 17, as we get ready to hear from our, our guest tonight, this is Jesus again speaking. He said, and, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. And in this church, we've seen many of that, and we, we still do today. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not harm them. Now, that this doesn't mean go and try it, Okay. Because there's, 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 the there's a fine line between faith and stupidity, okay? If you do it to yourself, that's just on you, okay? Well, the context here is you're going to be persecuted and people are going to try to kill you, okay? And in the midst of that persecution, God is saying, I'll protect you. But if you go home and you drink poison on your own, that's all you, okay? That's not, that's not the context here. Just don't get it twisted, okay? Right? And if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. In other words, there's an expectation that every Christ follower should have that God's not just going to work in me. He wants to work through me. And every time there's an opportunity, I want to believe, God, maybe you want to work through me in this situation. And if we're just faithful and we're, we're obedient with what we have, 
God can do amazing things. And I want you to hear a couple of stories before we close here. And so uh, la- last week, I shared a little bit about uh, Pastor Camille Omo and how she, as when she was just hospital administrator, Auntie Camille, she prayed for a man who was dead and he came back to life. And I wanted her, you to hear from her personally. So I invited her to come and she said yes. So will you help me welcome to the stage, Pastor Camille Omo. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. She reluctantly said yes because she's, she's a shy person. <laughs> that is so not true. Anyway, um, uh, when you were just you were working at Kuokini Hospital, uh, you were just new to the Christian faith. And um, you weren't Pastor Camille. You were just Auntie Camille. And um, you had this, in, you had, this situation came up that's now been, become legendary in our church. Um, But share from your perspective and your heart what that was like when you got the call, right? You heard over the the, the intercom that someone had coded. What was that situation like for you? Well, at that time, I was in the emergency room with a doctor and a medical social worker to discharge a patient that we were working with. And I've been there 16 years where where I heard heard hundreds of um, code 500, and code 500 means the, a patient's heart has rested, so the team needs, the unit need to get to that unit and, and uh, start to resuscitate the heart back to life. So I heard uh, code 500, uh, cardiac cath, and code 500, cardiac cath. It was the third code 100 cardiac cath that I clearly heard this voice stream right into my thoughts. It's not his time. And I remember those four words, and I, I thought to myself, you know, it's like shaking up, like, where did this voice come from? Because it's not even your thoughts. You're, you're already focusing on something else. So I thought to myself, wait, this patient is going to be discharged. It's not his time. Now, it doesn't make sense. Nothing makes sense. But there's something about God's voice that just grips your heart. that You can't shake it. And if you know pit bulls and raw meat, you cannot release them because they're fixed on it. Well, it's like the Holy Spirit grabs my heart, and I said, okay, if it's not this patient, then it must be the code. So I called the unit, and I said, oh, Shirley, um, who's coding, and what's happening? He goes, oh, it doesn't look like he's going to make it. I said, okay, I'm going to take care of this patient, then I'm going to come up right after I'm done. So in doing the discharge, I didn't realize 45 minutes went by, 55 minutes went by, and I looked at my the time, and I said, oh my gosh, I got to run up. So the MS medical search worker took care of that patient. So I ran up the flight of stairs and I approached her and I said, what happened to the cold? And she said, oh, he passed Camille. I said, he died, you know, at this time. And I said, no, no, no. I said, no, no, he's not dead. He's not dead. He's alive. And she goes, looks at me, she goes, here's the chart. This is the time of death. I said, can I please just give me a few minutes? Because as I'm going up the stairs, this anxiety comes into me. I'm getting scared. I say, what the heck are you doing? This is not normal. And it's, it's like beyond you. And when it's God, it's beyond. It's him. It's not you because he's, you know, he's just moving in you. And because I believe in him and I have faith, I'm going to act on that faith. So I said, Charlie, give me a few minutes before um, the family come because they're preparing the body for the view. So I went in and... Uh, <laughs> I, 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 crazy, it was crazy. Looking at a dead body, and I, I, the first thing I actually said was, uh, Mr. Noni, you don't know me, and I don't know you. Because I, I don't know what else to say to a dead body. What do you tell somebody that's not talking back? You know? <laughs> so, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, it's only me and him. And I said, I heard God said, it's not your time. So I banked on the words of God. If I banked on my feelings, I wouldn't be there. If I banked on my fear, I wouldn't be there. So I said, I didn't have enough words, I didn't have enough Bible, but I had enough to believe that God said. So when he said, it's not his time, I said, Mr. Noni, God said, you're not dead, and I speak against the spirit of death. So all that's within me, and you, you grab what's inside of you, whatever you do, read the word, it really, really helps, but you take. And how I gained that, because I would come to church, Pastor Norman would preach, and I would take those tidbits of words, and I would just Keep it in my soul, and I'm going to use that one day. And it was that day I said, you're not dead in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, then I thought to myself, get back to your senses. Like, wait, the Bible said, Lazarus, rise. Maybe I should say, Lazarus, rise. No, You know, it really sounds funny, but when you're desperate, you can do anything and everything to try to make it right. Because it's not common sense. It's God's sense. So it gripped my heart, and I thought to myself, okay, in the name of Jesus, by your stripes he's healed, by faith, God, you said to speak it. So, and I'm raising my hand, talking to this dead body, and, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm done. 
But Shirley came. She said, the family's here. They want to see the body. I said, okay. And I thought to myself, oh, he's going to get out of the bed and walk with me. But, <laughs> but that didn't happen, okay? <laughs> so I went um, downstairs, and I, I, I told my boss, I said, you know, Kat, that man is not dead. I, I got to tell you this. Now, they're not believers, but I'm going out to lunch. So I, I stuck up my um, out to lunch side, and I just started to pray because it didn't leave me. When you have to do something for God, it doesn't leave you until you come to completion. Until you find that peace, I say, in the name of Jesus, God, you said, he's not dead. I kept praying minutes after minutes. Now, it's past an hour. He's, he's past, well, past the hour. Then I get this beep. They never had cell phones. They had beepers, pagers. And then I had an overhead. Camille, almost stat, ICU. My boss knocks on my door. They want you to the unit really fast. And I said, okay. So I ran up the front of the stairs, and I went to Shirley. And I said, Shirley said, you're not going to believe this. And I said, what? She said, he's alive. And I said, I told you so. <laughs> I'll never forget those words. You know, it sounds jokingly, but when you're convicted, you know God's going to do something. And even if he didn't, I did the right thing. That's right. And no matter what happens, the, I do my best, he does the rest. Yeah. So when he, when they told me he was alive, so I peered in, I said, uh, you know, and I went down back in my office and I thanked God and I praised him because an ordinary woman, ordinary person, did such an extraordinary work for God. And he takes the most simple things in life if we're available to obey him. Amen. Uh, yeah, you can give God a hand for that. <clears throat> So he came back alive. The news people wanted to interview you and, and interview Pastor Norman, and, and, then, and then God used that to bring a bunch of people to yes. faith. You want to tell us about that? Yes, and just to let you know that the next morning, Pastor Norman came in to see him, Mr. Noni, and um, I, I waited till uh, the patient's family left, and I went to him personally. And I looked at him, and I said, Mr. Noni, um, you don't know me. Then I pause, and he turned to me. He says, yes, I do. I saw you praying next to me. Wow. That wow. was my confirmation, and I wept right there. Two strangers finally met. You know, I'm speaking to a live body now, so it's really happy. But I, I thanked him, and he ate his breakfast, and I left. Well, my boss and Shirley and her husband and three other people came to know the Christ to the miracle. Wow. Amen. That's great. What I, what I love about this is, you know, you know, in, in my mind, because I, I, I was still in high school when I heard this story. I just imagine Pastor Camille, you know, like, oh, the man's dead. No, he's not. You know what I'm saying? Like walking into the room, kicking the door down. Boom, you're getting up, you know, and just like bold. But, you know, when she tells the story, you realize the real anxiety, the fear, the nervousness, the un, being unsure about what to say, what to pray. But you were just faithful with the little that you had, whatever little word you had, and however little you knew how to pray, and God did the rest. Yes. And, and, and I love that because I think sometimes we over-spiritualize situations, you know. And, but it's just simple obedience. And you just simply did what God told you to do with what you knew in the moment. And God did the rest. And I wonder what would happen if every single one of us would do that. You know what I mean? I'm not saying go to hospitals and pray for dead people. But in the moments where God is, is grabbing onto your heart and you can't shake it. In those moments where you know, I should pray for that person. And you're tempted to go, can I pray for you? Or tempted to say, I'll, I'll, I'll pray later in my car by myself. You know what I'm saying? In those moments where we're tempted to step out and do the right thing or, or, or pull back because of fear and anxiety. I wonder what would happen if we all stepped out in faith like that. In those moments, I think we begin to hear more and more miracles and testimonies of God breaking out in our neighborhoods, in our communities, our schools, right, our workplaces, if we just dare to have simple faith and simple obedience uh, like you did. And so thank you for sharing that. Now, there was another story similar uh, uh, that happened this past Sunday at our 1115 service. Yes. And after the service, you found out about it. So can you, can you tell us about that story? Yes. Uh, Diane ran up to me with... Um uh, Sasal and her girlfriend, and they were they attended the 1115 service, and Pastor Bill was <clears throat> preaching, and they had a clip from the 700 Club about God, every little thing matters, and this one particular woman was healed, um, uh, her taste buds was healed, and while that clip was going on, Diane heard God say, "Tell Sasalin that her hearing is healed," and this is what she said to God, "Okay, later." That's all she said. Then the video continued, then Billy, Pastor Billy started to pray. Then God goes back to her again and says, place your hand upon her ear and tell her her, her hearing is, I'm healing her hearing, and she can hear me now. 
So now, if you know Diane, she's a prominent businesswoman. She has two wonderful companies. I mean, she is so refined. You would never see someone in a service putting their hands on somebody's ear doing service. But she did that. Then she placed her hand out, and immediately, Soslin's right ear popped. And she grabbed onto uh, Diane and says, I can hear her. 30 seconds later, the other ear popped, and she said, I can hear in both ears. Just to let you know, she was unable to hear for almost 20 years because of an accident. And then 15 service, God, through Diane, her obedience, did what God said, and this is what God did, brought the miracle. Amen. Give God a hand for that, too. You know what I love about that story is that it was just a normal person obeying God. I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to put my hands on yours and I'm going to pray. And I'm just going to obey that, that prompting that God's placed on my heart and God did the rest. And again, I wonder how many of us will have those kinds of opportunities throughout our weeks. And what would happen if we would just simply obey God? Offer the five loaves and two fish. This is so small. This is so stupid. But okay, God, I trust you with it. I think God is going to amaze us with what he can do. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Camille.